Hey, what's going on? Today on the podcast, we have best-selling author Bob Berg, who shares his five laws of success. Stick around. Thanks for uh, taking some time and and stopping by, man. I read your book a couple years ago, and then um, as we were doing research, the book came up again for, like, guests, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's right. It's Bob Berg, uh, Bob Berg's book. And I actually just Uh bought the Audible version of it, too. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was red, man. So, um, so you started as a, well, first of all, before we get into this, you, you guys notice his background? That's what a real book sh- shelf should look like. Just stock full of books. <laughs> no. So I, at my house, I have like the worst background ever because my office faces into my living room. Oh, so I yeah. bought this, I bought this background that is a bookshelf with books on it and it looks really good, but it's basically just like a faux wall background. So yeah. <laughs> like they need to, we need to take a screen cap of Bob's cause it looks much more, uh, much more <laughs> intricate. So but that's good. That's a legitimate bookshelf. Have you, uh, have you read every one of those books or is there like some, I'm going to get to these books? Yeah. You know, I, I've read most of them. There's a, there's a few I haven't, but the big, um, the big, pile of ones I haven't read are uh, you can't see it it's in the far left hand corner mm-hmm. and that's the ones that I have that I'm sure I'm gonna read one day which we both know I'm not gonna <laughs> but they're there because I don't have the heart to throw them out or you know and, and so forth and um, you know it's just people send me books and I pick up books that I just you know it's it's one of those things I'm I'm not the fastest reader I'm a consistent reader and that's why I've been able to read so many but there's still a lot of them I just there's no way I'm going to get, I'm looking over there. I get intimidated looking at it. It's like, they're all looking at me. Ah, that's you know, funny. Off that I haven't, haven't read them yet. So I know one of the books that you've read that, um, I was a big fan of too. Um, when I first got into sales was some of the Zig Ziglar's. Did you read like see you at the top and all those? Oh yeah. All, all those, those are my first ones really that I read. Yeah. Those are great books. Yeah. How did you go from being in broadcasting to sales? What was that, that leap like? And why did that happen? I, you know, it's really just cause I wasn't a really good broadcaster. You know, I was, I was, uh, the, I, I started out as a sportscaster and that's what I, you know, had planned to do. Uh, I couldn't really get a job anywhere in, in sport other than the, the small local radio station I was at. And a, a, a job came up in television uh, for, to do news. I figured, well, I'll do news for a while until, you know, I did sport, until I could get a sports job. But uh, so I was doing the, the news at a, uh, at a very, very small ABC affiliate in the Midwestern United States. And I just really wasn't that good at it at all. And uh, I, I, and I was in a small market, so you don't make a lot of money in those markets. So I really just started to sell just as a way to make some extra money and having the feeling that broadcasting probably wasn't going to be my, my living. And I, you know, and it's not that I had a knack for it. I didn't, I really floundered the first few months until I went into a bookstore and saw Zig's books, Tom Hopkins books, and started really, really studying them and applying them. And boom, a few weeks later, my sales are going through the roof and I was hooked. And I, I just knew I had something I wanted to pursue. And I love the personal development aspect. You know, one of the things that uh, always stood out to me in Zig Ziglar's books, and if you read a lot of, uh, I'm sure you do a lot of um, sales and psychology books, there's a lot of parallels. And there's a parallel in, in your book to one of the things that always stuck out in my head in Zig Ziglar's book is saying that you can have everything in life you want if you just help enough p- get people get everything they want. And that, that, that's kind of like a truism that goes through, uh, through your book as well. I love, I love that saying of Ziggs. Uh, I think it says everything. It really, you know, is that saying is the epitome of what a free market does, okay? Because the only way in a, a free market-based economy, and when I say free market, I simply mean no one is forced to do business with anyone else. So the only way in a free market economy that you can thrive is to help other people thrive, right? And I remember one of my, one of my great heroes and a person I consider a mentor, Harry Brown, used to say in any market-based, any free market-based exchange, there are always two profits, the buyer profits and the seller profits because each of them come away better off afterwards than they were beforehand. Yeah. For sure. So, and that's, you know, and that's what Zig says. So you can, yeah, you can have everything in life you want if, if you will help um, other people get what, um, get, uh, the other people get what they want. And so, so that, and so what we need to do for that is place our focus on them. And, you know, and, and that's the key. It's that, it's that what we call an other focus, you know, as opposed to an I focus, because let's face it, Nobody, and I, you know, I say this when I speak at sales conferences, 
nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet, right? You know, they're not going to buy from you because you need the money and they're not even going to buy from you just because you're a really nice person. Yeah. You know, right? gonna... that, that makes a ton of sense. I remember the, um, the, I started a sales career at Bally's and I started kind of in a similar path where I was doing martial arts and I got into personal training just because I needed to make an extra few bucks and rapidly realized I was a horrible personal trainer, got into sales, started reading a bunch of books. Another thing I think, uh, Zig said was like, nobody like sales is something you do for someone, not to someone. Not to someone and that's right? like, that's a different mindset because a lot Absolutely. of people, salespeople, like we have this ego sometimes, like we want to close the sale and we want to win, but sometimes that comes at the cost of the other person. And that mindset's very short sighted. That's one of the things uh, I love about your book is it's building you. those relationships and it's the, the big picture thing that the more you can help someone, like nobody's walked out of a sale and said, man, that guy's a great closer. He really closed this shit out of me. Like that was wonderful. <laughs> right. That's never happened. Exactly. Exactly. They respect and they love the salespeople and they will refer the salespeople who they know had a true interest in helping them yeah. and serving them. That's why I've, I've said for, you know, 35 years, however long I've been doing this, that uh, all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like and trust. And they're not going to trust you because you're focused on yourself. They're gonna focus. They're gonna trust you because you're focused on them. So, how did guys like Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins influence your growth into writing the book? Oh uh, well, you know, they were really the first people that that they taught me how to be a professional salesperson. Uh, and again, it was through their books at first. Then I started buying their and 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 I'm dating myself here, but but buying their audio cassette tape albums. I mean, that's a long time ago, right? Yeah, do, for do sure. Any of your listeners even know what an audio cassette tape album is, right? You know, yeah, like, yeah, so a few of them. I think our, ad, <laughs> our demographic's five years younger than me. I'm 40. I had a couple of audio yeah, cassette they don't tapes. Know of, <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Like, what is what is that thing that VHS yeah. tapes are these old yeah, relics? One, one step above an eight-track tape <laughs> yeah. which was when I was growing up, which is what we, you know, put into the, yeah. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I was listening to their, their tapes, uh, of course, read their books, started... Um, uh, you know, I would go to their seminars and, you know, I mean, I just learning from them and, and, you know, they really had the right idea. They understood that selling was all about the other person. And I, and I, I think that's, you know, I, I remember I, and I was in sales a couple of years uh, and, and, you know, again, doing pretty well, but I, I went to work for another company and I was selling a, a, a high ticket item and I, I started out in a slump. And I, I just wasn't getting out of that slump. And I made a real rookie mistake in that rather than getting my mind and focus off of myself and, and thinking of my clients, I was pressing, right? And, I, and it was about making the sale and it was about me and it was about me getting out of my slump, right? And I, I was just digging myself deeper and deeper. And I, I came back to the office one day and there was a, a, a guy there who was an older guy. He wasn't in the sales department. I think he was an engineer or something, real nice guy. Didn't, didn't say a lot, but one of these people we've all known, right? That when they, when they do say something, it tends to be very profound. And I think he saw me as sort of like Joe in the, in the go-giver, you know, that young up and coming, ambitious, aggressive, really on it, but very, very frustrated person because my focus was just like Joe's in the story. My focus was on myself, not where it should be. And, and he took me aside and he said, Berg, he was a last name kind of guy. He said, Berg, can I give you some advice? And I said, absolutely, please do. I, I need it. And he said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he said, you'll get a reward. And that reward will come in the form of money. And you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It ain't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And, you know, that's, I think, when it really hit me that great salesmanship is never about the salesperson. Right? It's, a, it's never about the product or service as important as, as those are, whether you're selling gym memberships or houses or widgets or, or whatever. Great, great salesmanship is always about the other person. It's about, it's about adding value 
to that other person's life. Uh, really, it's about that other person's life being better just because you are part of it. And I think when we approach sales, when we approach business, when we approach life that way, we're really nine steps ahead of the game in a 10 step game. So when you laid out your book, how did you decide on and land on the five like, core values, value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and um, uh, receptivity? How did you land on those and how did you decide which order that you were going to present those? Well, as John and I were writing it, and, and I had asked John to, to be the co-author uh, and lead writer. He's a brilliant author. I'm a, I'm a how-to guy. I'm step one, step two, step all of my books before that, all my books since that, anything I haven't written with John have been how-to books. So uh, John, I had asked him to, you know, to, to really spearhead this in terms of the writing because he's just so good at it. And, and when, we were, when we were putting down the principles, the first couple were kind of, you know, we sort of had those. It all starts with value. That's the, the, you know, value, which is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. And so you know, it, it has to start with providing a really, truly value-based experience to another person. And that's from the minute you meet this person through the relationship building process, through the follow-up, follow through the sales process, the referral process, it all begins with the value that you focus on providing another person. So that was pretty easy. And then compensation, which takes it to the, the level of, you know, okay, it's great to provide that uh, fantastic value, but how many lives are you really touching with that? So, you know, the law of compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. That was, those are pretty obvious to us. The next one influence was because, you know, really, how does that start? How do you go about that? What is influence really? And, and how do you communicate that uh, to, to others? Uh, and then the last two, we always say kind of wrote themselves, you know, authenticity, which is you know, such an overused word these days, but really it means nothing more than living congruently with your values. And, and so we knew that was important because if you don't have that, again, you can have everything else, but you're only gonna go so far, you know, without really coming at it from your true core, through, you know, from yourself. And then the law of receptivity was because we needed that, not, not opposite, but that other side of the same coin. You know, we're talking about giving value, giving value, giving value, touching, you know, the whole thing. Well, there's that certain point where, where what is the, the end result of that? And that's receptivity. That's the ability to to receive that which you've created through the value you've provided. And this is why John and I say that money is simply an echo of value, right? It's the thunder, if you will, to values lightning, which means the value must come first. That's why it's law one, right? The value must come first. The the money you receive is simply a a natural result of the value you've provided. Would you say dogs are the ultimate go-givers? Oh, I always say they are. Absolutely. You can go through every one of those those laws and and yes, absolutely. Yeah, like they, those, they're just always like super. There's an old joke, like you lock your dog and your wife in the trunk of your car, come back in two hours, see which one's excited to see you. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, it makes sense. My dog's always super happy. So where did, oh, yeah. where did, is there a backstory behind Rachel's famous coffee? Where How did that start? How did that become a pivotal thing in the book? Well, I, I know, and, and they're really, she's one of the few characters that wasn't even, wasn't based on anyone. Uh, you know, the other characters were either compilations of people or, or kind of modeled after their people we know. I'm just a huge coffee fanatic, and uh, I'm a Dunkin' Donuts guy. And, yeah. um, and you know, I, and so I, I kind of pictured the taste of Dunkin' Donuts coffee as, as we were writing that. But um, it was just a good opportunity to kind of show that, if someone, it doesn't matter where they come from, that if they are willing to bring value to others, if they're, if they're willing to, to solve challenges, if they're willing to be that person who takes it upon themselves to, to just, I guess, improve people's lives just through being and doing what they do, that they can, that they can um, be very, very successful. So, so how, yeah. How do you explain a guy that's probably the, antithesis of that he's probably a go-taker a guy like donald trump who like for all me most measurable metrics 
there's horrendous horror stories out about him, but like someone like that that's been successful by being ruthless and shrewd and things like that, do you think it's just he's an outlier or is that just like the dark path to go down for the other way to get successful? Yeah, so so there's a couple of issues there, I think. Um, one is that, you know, by being a go-taker, okay, and that's the opposite of a go-giver because, of course, a go-getter we love. Go-getters are people of action. So we want people to be go-getters, people of action, and go-givers, people who are focused on providing immense value to others. Be a go-getter and a go-giver, just not a go-taker, right? And so you can actually succeed being a go-taker. Um, it's hard work. And, you know, you, you're not necessarily, and I'm not talking about Donald Trump right here, I'm just saying in the generic fashion, but we all know go-takers who have done very well financially, okay? And they, they operate on what Wallace D. Waddles in his fantastic 1910 book, The Science of Getting Rich, called the competitive plane. So there's the creative plane, which is more go-giver focused, and there's the competitive plane. Um, go, the, the, go -get, the, the creative plane sees the world as abundant. OK, the competitive plane sees the world as zero sum and you've got to get yours before the other person does. If you win, the other person lose. And there's there's people who can who can make it because they are really, really good on the competitive plane. But they have to work very, very hard, ceaselessly. They don't have a whole lot of people on their side. And uh, it's it's difficult to have positive personal relationships when you're a go-taker just because of the type of person you are. Now, that, is, that said, let's go back to Donald Trump for a second. And I think he, I think in the, in politics, he's actually more of a go-taker than he was even in, in, in business, let's say. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll explain why. Because Donald Trump, if you, you know, with the products he created, uh, especially the hotel and, and hospitality industry, which is really his forte, okay? They were always high, very high quality. I mean, he provided tremendous value to his customers. Uh, he served a whole lot of people. Those are law one and two. Now, in terms of influence, which is placing the other person's interests first, no, as far as him being a human being, no, it's, it's his interests first. However, remember, in a free market economy, no one has to buy from you. So he knew he had to make, he had to put the customer's interest first because they're not buying for his sake, they're buying for their sake, mm -hmm. right? Authent authenticity, I don't think he ever came off as anything but himself. And of course, receptivity, he was a multi-billionaire, so he, he obviously allowed himself to receive. So I, I think sometimes we confuse maybe being a go-giver with being a nice person. And while I'd like to think most go-givers are generally nice people, and most are, uh, I don't think that's, I don't think that's, um, a hundred percent true. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think in terms of politics though, and by the way, you know, I don't know enough about him business wise to know that, that, that what I'm saying is totally true. I'm saying just from what I've observed, read and, and, and so forth. But as a politician, remember politics is not free market, right? So, so if you can corner a certain amount of, of people who are on your side, and leave two only two choices, Coke or Pepsi. Then it's really not mar the market. It's not like people have a choice of what they, you know, they, you know what I'm saying. So, sure. so there's ways, and that's why politicians who would never make it. I'm not again. I'm not talking about Donald Trump, but I'm talking about many, many, the majority of politicians who can do great at politics would never really make it necessarily in the free market as an entrepreneur. You know, so I mean. What do you say to someone that grew up in this, the mindset that like, you know, it's a dog eat dog world and especially in a field like sales where it's super competitive, it's, it's hard to condition yourself to get out of that mindset of thinking about your own priorities first. Like, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you, um, what type of like systems do you put in place so that you can kind of check yourself and make sure that you're, you're operating from the place of value, comp uh, compensation, influence and all that? Yeah. So it, it kind of in a way I, I think comes down to the the question of yeah you know this this go-giver stuff um, you know putting other people's interests first and you know all that that sounds all nicey nice and everything and yeah once I once I'm I'm wealthy and, and don't have to worry about it I, I can start doing that but for right now I really need the money so I need to be focused just on the money okay so so let's say that's the 
the person's mindset, okay? Which, which is a lot of people's mindset because that's how we've been brought up to think of sales, right, in, in business. And so, so, you know, I might say to the person, let's do kind of a thought experiment and, and make believe that you're the prospect and I'm the salesperson. And, you know, I'm that person who, again, I really need the money. I don't have time for this go-giver stuff. I'm gonna go in there and my goal is to close the sale, get the money and get out of it, right? So, so I go in and, and we start our discussion. And, you know, I'm asking you questions because I've been taught and trained to ask questions, but I'm not really listening to, to understand your needs, wants, and desires. I'm more or less asking questions just to kind of get some information that can help me sharp angle you into a close later on. Um, I'm kind of, you know, interrupting you because, you know, because I want to get to the point and get this thing happening. Uh, when you have an objection, I'm, I'm a little bit defensive about it because this objection of yours is standing in the way of my money, right? And I, I try to just overcome the objection, right? Uh, and I'm closing too early and too much. And, uh, you know, I, I'd ask the question, are you in this situation, are you, all things being equal, are you more likely or less likely to buy from me right now? And I think most people would probably say less likely, okay? So now let's take the same situation. I'm that same, or I'm a salesperson in that same situation. I, I need the money and you know, so forth and so on. But now what I'm gonna do is, it's not that I'm going to um, deny my self-interest, but I'm gonna suspend it. I'm gonna put it to the side and I'm gonna place my focus totally on bringing immense value to you. So we're meeting and I'm now I'm asking you questions but these questions, you know, I'm asking because I want to know your thoughts. I want to know what it is you need, want, and desire. And not only that, when you tell me, I'm going to ask you to, and I'm going to do it diplomatically and tactfully, but I'm going to ask you to clarify, to make sure that what you said is what I heard and that what you meant is what I understood. And by the time our, dis our, our discovery session is over, you're going to know that I know what you're looking for. Okay. Um, only when I do know that, am I going to then connect the, the, the benefits of my product or service with what you need, want, or desire. When you have an objection, I'm going to welcome it. And I'm going to assure you it's a good question and that we need to work through it to make sure that you're comfortable with the process. But rather than just answering the objection itself, which may just be a manifestation of, of what's something going on inside, that you don't really even understand or what have you, we're going to work together to kind of go to the root of that objection and discover what it really is. Then we're going to work through it together to your satisfaction. And Jason, by the time I ask for the order, I am simply asking you to do something that you've already told me you want to do. Now my question would be, are you more likely or less likely to buy from me right now? And the chances are probably more likely. So that person who sees sales that, you know, that first way, they need to understand really why it's actually in their best interest to place the other person's interest first. Do you have a, from all the courses and um, lectures and stuff that you do regarding your book, what's the biggest challenge that people have just fully adopting these principles? I think that they've been, they've been brought up and raised on the idea, and this is, this is a combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, news media, social media, television, movies, where the business person or anybody with money is painted as some kind of thief or, you know, someone who is, has done horrible things or stepped on others toes or, you know, very rarely in any television show, movie, media, what have you, is the salesperson or business person presented in a positive light. Right. And right. so people have grown up with this. And that's the biggest thing. It's, it's helping people get past those assumptions they have based on the information that they've been exposed to constantly forever. Yeah, it's funny because we live in a capitalist world. And I think that um, there's almost this this like mythology that, um, you know, rich people are happy, poor people are sad, uh, chasing money is bad, being poor is OK. And I think that like you made a you were, did an interview where you talked about the difference between capitalism and cronyism. And I think that that's very that's very, uh, very smart and a great thing to point out. So 
having the, the, the mindset change, how do you talk to someone that says, well, look, man, I've been, I'm a giver, but how do I know when this becomes a line of now someone's just taking advantage of me? Right. Right. So uh, that's a great question, Jason. I, I love that because it is a, it is a good question because it's a very natural question, in, right, to, to think about. And, and, and so the first thing I would do is, is to say that, that there's absolutely nothing about being a go-giver that is congruent with being a doormat or a martyr or self-sacrificial or being taken advantage of. Right. So I, you know, so I, I would say that if you, not you, but if a person is finds themselves being constantly taken advantage of, let's say, right, by others, and I don't mean once or twice or what I mean, if you live life, it's going to happen, but I mean as a pattern. Okay. And if you find that's, you know, that happens with you, then it's important to, to, to know that this is happening not because you're a nice person or because you're a giver but because you're doing things in a certain way that creates the environment for you to be taken advantage of. And, and, and if someone understands this and realizes that the first thing I'd say is congratulations, because it's only when we understand there's a problem that we're in a position to be able to do something constructive about it. And, and, and so, you know, so the first thing is say, well, why is this happening? You know, why is it that I'm always the one involved in this okay we might even ask you know what is the payoff right like is there a reason that i'm doing this is it because i i don't feel i'm worthy of of being treated well with respect and receiving or or what have you is it because there's um it's it's an excuse that i can use for not being as successful as i think i should be well but people are always taking advantage of me otherwise i would is it a payoff of being a martyr oh for me, I'm always being, and I'm not saying that's any of these things. I'm just saying we need to, to check our premises and look at every one of these situations and say, why did this happen? What signs were there that had I been paying attention, I could have seen and then, you know, acted on appropriately. Do you think that your book applies primarily just to, in a business sense? Or for instance, if you gave your book to 16 year old Bob Berg, does that help you become a pro baseball player? Uh, does it help you become a pro baseball player? You know, I, as a, my dream growing up was to play third base for the Boston Red, Red Sox. Sox yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I had, you know, no talent to speak of that would allow me, you know, I was all field, no hit, you know, so <laughs> that, that didn't work out real well. But uh, so I, I think that, you know, you, you, you do have to have that, that talent, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of people who, um, who, who do that we hear, you know, parents who share this book with their kids, with their teens, and the teens get it. I mean, it's really pretty cool. Um, we've even had, we had a teacher, uh, Randy Stelter, who took this and, and made a, um, uh, you know, for teachers, a, uh, I, like a, <laughs> I sil a syllabus or like syllabus, a, yeah, yeah, to be able to and, and so forth, and and it's been great. He's been teaching that you know to his his uh, senior English class, I think every every year, and we have a whole bunch of teachers doing that. But you know, it's not in a whole bunch of school systems. We'd love it to be, but the point is, the kids get it. Yeah. You know, they really do. So yeah, I think the the message does does help because again, it's all about saying how can I be, how can I make myself a value, how can I take personal responsibility, right, and and be of value. Uh, to others. Have you ever thought about doing um, like a shortened kids version of this? Because, you know, we talked a lot about how like we you get brought up in this dog eat dog world, zero sum yeah. game. And a lot of that has to do with um, environmental factors. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, who I'm a big fan of, has a board game out that I play with my yeah. kids. I mean, my kids, um, you know, 10 years old, they've been reading. My, my son knew what an asset and liability was from the time he could take a bottle out of his mouth. So, it's, you know, I think that a couple of the things that the schools don't teach are, I think some of the, the school system is just antiquated, but like, I mean, I, I don't remember the last time I've used trigonometry on my daily basis, on a daily basis, but <laughs> things like financial acumen, business sense, um, networking. Do you think there's a place for like a children's book or a shortened version of this for the six, seven, eight year olds to start getting into a simple, easy to grasp way to get their mindset moving in that direction? Yeah. Oh, I, I think there is. Uh, and I think it would be very, especially with John David Mann as the, you know, the, the lead storyteller, I, it would, it, it could absolutely, absolutely be done. Yeah. And they do get it. I, you know, so it's really cool. So you're at a, I'm change the subject for a second here. You said something about um, being at a dinner party with Ben Franklin. So if you, you could be at a dinner party with Ben Franklin, what would you ask him? 
Boy, you're a real pro. You you do your research, don't you? Wow. I, I try to. I try to. Wow. Uh, well, that you know that speaks to your success and why you are so successful. That's 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 uh, wonderful. So, what would I ask Ben about? One of the things I I love that Ben did that that really touched my life in a very deep way was in his biography. He talked about the uh, his his self improvement course that he developed. Right, the thirteen virtues. And it was a matter of taking some weaknesses or character flaws he felt he had that were going to keep him from really being as successful as he could be. And he, he created his own self-improvement course where he could take those weaknesses and really turn them into strengths. And when I was in my mid thirties, one of my mentors, Charlie Tremendous Jones, and uh, again, I, I don't know if you remember that name, but he was one of the real old time kind of, you know, personal development guy, just a, a great, great human being. But he sent me Ben's book, The Autobiography, and I, I read it and, you know, I applied what, what Ben said. It was a game changer for me. And, you know, within a year, I was a different person. Um, and so I would, I would probably talk to, to Ben about that. You know, that would be the first thing I would ask him about. You know, speaking of game changers, it doesn't touch directly on what you were just saying, but there's a, that documentary on Netflix, Game Changers. You're vegan, right? Are you vegetarian? Yeah. But you are unbelievable. You're great. And yes, yes, <laughs> Thank I you. Am. Appreciate it. So, um, so how long have you been vegan, and, and what made you decide to go down that route? So it's it's been about five years. Uh, I've always been an animal lover. Always been an animal fanatic. Okay, in terms of my love for animals, but. Like most people, I never paid attention to the absolute brutality that factory farm animals go through to be our dinner, to be our clothes, to be our, you know, and not to mention entertainment and all these different, uh, even, you know, dairy, same thing. I mean, the, 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 these cows are, you know, machine raped basically, and their babies are taken away at birth and the screaming and the, and the violence that factory farm animals go it, it's horrendous it really is and so once i once i really s saw it okay and watched the videos and read about it and learned about it my uh cognitive dissonance came in when i'd be eating a steak right you know and and i'd you know i'm eating the steak enjoying the steak knowing that not only was a you know was was uh, you know, a live human creature, an innocent human creature killed, but brutally killed, brutally raised, just horribly treated. And it, so I can have a steak. And uh, it, it finally got to me. And I just said, I can't do this anymore. You know, it was it was weighing to, you know, cogn it's interesting with cognitive dissonance, because the way you handle it is how well, you either ignore it, or you embrace it and say, I just don't care. Or you change. And if you feel strongly enough about it, you change. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, um, you know, going back a little bit, we talked about podcasts and research and stuff. You had a podcast for a while. You stopped doing it. You got pulled in other directions. If you were to look back at, I mean, I think you did, what, almost 200 episodes right around there. Um, if you were to look back at, you, before you did your first podcast and you could give yourself some advice, what do you wish you knew now about podcasting that you wish you knew then? I would just say how much work it was really going to be because I, I did what you do. I mean, I researched people and made sure I knew all about them when I read their books. I mean, I highlighted and underlined and did it, which I do when I read books anyway, but this it's different when you're preparing for a podcast because you've got X amount of minutes to get in the information. Um, if I just, if I just knew how much of a pain in the neck it was going to be, I still would have done it. I just wouldn't have been as disappointed that it was such a pain in the neck. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's funny. So at what point did you um, make the transition? Did, did you box and did Golden Gloves? Did, did you also play baseball during that time? Because most of the guys that, like, I don't think of myself as an athletic person. And, like, I got into martial arts and really had to strive to be good at something. But you won, you were Golden Gloves champ. I mean, you're very, that, that mindset, that competitiveness, that, you know, all the sacrifice and dedication it takes to reach a level of success like that, even though Golden Gloves is amateur boxing, it still speaks uh, value, uh, volumes. At what point did you realize, all right, this isn't gonna translate to my baseball aspirations? <laughs> so, so I played baseball up till I think 10th grade, uh, and I, I got cut from the, the team. 
and which was really disappointing to me again though I, I look back on it and i can understand why but it was disappointing back then um i would have tried out probably the next year again um but uh i i dated a gal a couple of times and it turned out her dad was uh who was one of the guys who ran the local boxing gym uh and i didn't even know there was one at the time uh, there's some, you know, boxing in my family background and that my dad, uh, after World War II, he um, ran the famous Fifth Street uh, uh, fight gym, Chris and Angelo Dundee. And again, you'd have to be a real boxing fanatic in my age to, you know, kind of go back and know who these people are. But, but uh, Angelo Dundee was the trainer for Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, and, you know, a bunch of notable people. My dad ran that gym. So, so there was always, you know, my dad didn't want me to box amateur, by the way. But, but it was always kind of in the blood, if you will. And, uh, and so I, I went to the gym. Uh, uh, my friend's uh, dad had invited me. And I kind of knew right there that was something I wanted to do. So, um, yeah, and from there, baseball got lost, got, got forgotten. Um, it's still really one of my true loves. And I, I love watching it, you know, and I love going to a Marlins game. And it is, as terrible as they've been over the, you know, the years, it's still... And of course, grew up as a Red Sox fanatic. I live in Florida now, so I'm a Marlins fan. Of course, the Red Sox were nice enough to wait until I had moved to Florida before they finally won a World oh, Series. Oh, dude, you, you get no sympathy from me. Uh, I'm from Chicago. We had the Cubs. So, oh, okay. So, <laughs> see, yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. Craziness. And um, and so uh, yeah, so once I got into boxing, that really became my life for about three and a half years. Yeah. So when you when you boxed and you spent all that time getting ready for those events, did you ever have any aspirations to go pro or make that a career, or was that just a hobby? Yeah, no, I, I had aspirations for it, but I ended up having a brain contusion uh, and that kind of, uh, you know, I started to get hit very lightly and have a splitting headache afterwards. And, and at that point, the doctor, my dad, I remember taking me to the doctor and the doctor did something like put a, two fingers in front of my eyes and saw my the pupils and said, you're through boxing. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, got the, the yeah. rug yanked out from underneath you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, if you could give one piece of advice to people that are like in high school right now, you know, you, they, with the world's shortest attention spans, everybody wants to hop on Roblox. I mean, we're in a society of instant gratification, right? So like oh, yeah. the networking skills, I feel are, are fairly diminished because you know what 70% of the way we communicate is voice inflection and body language. And right now we're online so much, we're on our phones, we're Googling. If you could give uh, 15 seconds of, of snippet advice to high school kids, what do you think that would be to help them be successful? You know what, the first thing I would advise to any high school kid is learn and study everything you can about human nature because that's who you're going to be dealing with you know and learn everything you can about it why people do what they do what drives people what motivates people and while everybody is an individual certainly there are also certain general principles and rules right that all people that you know that those general psychological characteristics that we all have as human beings and we can form patterns from that. And when we really understand what drives people, we're in a position to add value to them. And to the degree, I would tell them that you can add value to the lives of others. That's the degree that you are gonna be successful. Yeah, that's brilliant, man. There's a, there's a great book that obviously sales and psychology are so closely mirrored to one another in yeah. terms of, um, you know, understanding wants and desires one of the best books i read was never split the difference have you oh, ever have you read that great. i interviewed chris on my podcast chris I voss had. yeah he's he's yeah. great i mean i think that like you great talked about book like mirroring back and uh, like tactical empathy and i think that there's a lot of parallels when you start reading a lot of the books whether you're you you can use these skills if you're an fbi hostage negotiator where you have to build a rapport like super fast under the right. most treacherous conditions with someone who who in the back of their head knows that you don't have their best interest in mind, you know? So, Great. um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting to see the parallels and that stuff, man. So you have a bunch of online courses. What's the next uh, book that you're going to, you know, you put out books afterwards, you're back to the how to, you haven't written, re written with your partner. <laughs> what's uh, what's the next thing we can look for from you? Yeah. You know, I don't really have any books that, that I have in mind to come out. I, I have, by the way, just, uh, you know, you had brought up about, uh, about the go giver for kids. And, uh, you know, I did bring that up to John and it's something that we've talked about maybe doing, but John, who's a, you know, really he's a professional co-author is what he is. I mean, he's, again, this guy's so brilliant as a writer that everybody wants to write, you know, books with him. 
And so it, I think it's so far behind in terms of when it would be something he would want to get to. But I would like to do, you know, a, a go-giver book for kids, even if it's for teens, you know, and, and, and but, um, but that aside, I don't really have any, any books I want to write at this point. I kind of feel that what, now my, my personal favorite book I've ever written, by the way, is a how-to book. It's called Adversaries Into Allies, which is all about people skills, which is, you know, kind of my favorite topic. Um, and so, you know, that, I, I think I'm kind of committing myself to really making sure that gets out there in the marketplace better than it has at this point. So I'd say, while I don't have any new books out, I'm kind of approaching that one as a new book. Yeah, do, do you find that you are um, you read more or you listen to more audiobooks nowadays? Oh, read, read more. Yeah. Really? I'm a reader. I, I just really enjoy that. Yeah. Kin- Kindle or paperback? Uh, no, nah, paperback. I, you know, I'm 63 years old. I know that's no excuse, okay? There's plenty of 63-year-olds who, who you know, do the, the Kindle and all that. I just don't. I'm old school when it comes to that. I want that feel of the book in my hand, and I want to yeah, do the highlight. Yeah, something underline. visceral about having, like, just tangible something about paper. It. I, it's, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I have a myriad of, like, written notes and, and typed up notes, but the same thing. Like, I listen to audiobooks, but typically only mm-hmm. after I've read the book so that I can kind of do other things, and then it just oh, it reinforces reinforces like the the theories and principles behind it but um but that's awesome man well, i know you got a ton of stuff going on and i appreciate you taking some time to sit down and chat and we'll put up all your in are you mostly instagram facebook your um what's your your social media uh, that you're on the most I, linkedin I'm, I'm doing more now on linkedin than LinkedIn? i than i had before yeah yeah let's be the um, first linkedin graphic we could throw up all right yeah <laughs> oh that's okay what you no know, we'll do it no we, we we got it that'd be awesome man. Well, i appreciate it well um Thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate everything, man. And um, I got to check out, where can I find the interview with Chris Voss? Because I love Chris's stuff. Is that so one of yours? You, yeah, podcasts? if you go to, to um, berg.com, uh, which is the main website, and then um, go to where it says podcast, and that will take you to the Go-Giver podcast. And they're all, you know, all whatever, their 200 and something episodes are all there in the archives, and they're going to stay there and just just put Chris Voss in the uh in the um, search, but yeah, he, he was great. And I just, yeah, again, I highly recommend his book. I just think everyone should read that. Yeah. It, it's such a great book. I got to get Chris on the, uh, the podcast. I got to have my guys reach out to him and, and get him. Cause he's, he, he's one of my favorite books. I've read his book. Oh yeah. Times he's too, a so. great interview. Yeah. He does yeah. A good job. Just real quick before I let you go, I had Ben Mesrich on and um, he's like, man, writing just is fucking, it's lonely. You're like, lock yourself in a room. He didn't sound like he likes it much. Do you find writing to be who, something who you that? Would, uh, Ben Mesrich? He writes, oh. uh, he wrote like the, the, um, the antisocial or accidental billionaires, which became the movie, oh. the, the Facebook movie. He wrote um, "Bringing Down the House," which was based on those MIT guys that were doing the card counting. That became yeah, the movie 20, okay, 21 yeah, with the Kevin, Sp- uh-huh. yeah, twenty one with Kevin Spacey, um, and like he just wrote "Bitcoin Billionaires," which I'm a huge Bitcoin nerd. And um, but he like he was just saying like oh, writing is just arduous. I know some people yeah. love writing, and I think for the most of the authors that I speak to that have success, it's like it's like uh, the idea of writing a whole book is just so daunting. No, I always say, and I don't think I made this up, but I, but I, I always say I don't like writing books. I like having written books. Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel you. That's right. It's, I'm actually the opposite with kids. I don't like having kids, but I liked making the kids. So, so just kidding. I love you guys. I got four kids. My wife's gonna kill me. So thanks, your, man. Your I, daddy loves you. I love them tremendous. They know that. I love. You. Um, but I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you so much. We'll send you a link oh, to everything. Oh, my pleasure. Thank, that was thanks awesome, for having buddy. me. You're awesome. Yeah, Thank I you. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thanks, Bob. Take care, man.